So we're in the presence of a cannibal. No, I, I had I had a little growth one, so I so I asked the doctor to keep it, and I took it home, cooked it, and I ate it. I actually give my flesh. I wanted to, I wanted to know what it tasted like. It was experimental. It? it did actually taste like chicken. Let's go back to the screen. It wasn't a spot. Oh. <laughs> right. So to, today we're going to start off by looking at cannibalism. Today we're going to look at cannibalism and uh, and the very interesting um, subject that will lead then on to the Lady of Pavlan Cave. Now, the idea of cannibalism conjures up one thing in most people's minds: the idea of Hannibal Lecter, the Silence of the Lambs, and eating people whilst they're still alive, or killing somebody to eat that flesh. <coughs> However, um, there's another side to cannib cannibalism, eating one's relatives to keep the spirit of that relative alive inside you. Now, I had quite a full, full room in Lanthrop Major today, and every single hand went up in the room when I said, if you had a choice between starving or eating one of your relatives that has just died, every single one put their hand up and said, I would eat a relative that has just died. Lantra, <laughs> you've never been there. But anyway, the the point with all this is, is that the idea of cannibalism is something that has become mutated and transferred to mean something evil and wrong in modern day society. I feel personally there's nothing wrong with eating the flesh of somebody that's just died. You're keeping the spirit, spirit of that individual inside you, um, and that person's memory, because if you absorb their flesh, um, is, is forever. It's never going to go away. You're always going to remember that person. But that's my take on it. Now, this skull itself is part of a collection of, of um, skeletal remains um, that was excavated some time ago. And it's only now that we're starting to realise that all the gnaw, gnaw marks on humerus, ulnars, the long bones, um, even some of the small bones in the human um, collection of bones that they found at this site, at Goff's Cave in Somerset, they do not show signs of wolves chewing at the bones. They actually show signs of human beings chewing at the bones. You okay, Gaila? Yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? You're not. Are you got all prickly? Sometimes. Don't don't die, Gwenda. <laughs> if you. Sarah's health is horrible. Long long time ago, I was cooking some raisin steak. This was a long time ago, yeah, and I actually bought human flesh, and I didn't eat beef for about twenty years after. And now I only eat very raisins. Gwenda, yeah. 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 if this does get too much for you. Um, leave yeah. Yeah, leave me alone, yeah. Okay. Uh, but we do have the Lady of Pavlan Cave coming up, okay? Yeah, yeah. I don't know who she is. She's a man, isn't she? Exactly. Yeah. Now, moving on with the images. They found a whole collection of bones, not just of adults, but of a child of three years old. And it said that the child of three years old had the same treatment as the other adults who had died within this community. Um, I asked one person in Lanthrop Major today if they would have, if they had an option um, in prehistory of eating the flesh of an adult or a child, um, they would have gone for the flesh of the child because the flesh would easily detach off the bone um, and the bone was, of course, softer. Mm. And Glenda, <laughs> it, it gets it better. It, it, it gets <laughs> better. Um, she said that she would go for the flesh of a child. Now, this isn't just um, fiction now. Every time that we found human bones in archaeology, 
and they and we see no marks on them. We always say that they're no marks from a rat or they're no marks from a wolf or a dog. Uh, in the instance of these bones, archaeologists have now understood that humans are eating human flesh. Now there's a running theme today of about misinterpretation of the past. I've got an article of the week um, of bones that were found with Viking armour associated with the bones. And archaeologists excavating that assemblage of bones always said, because the armour's there, that the skeletal remains underneath the armour are actually those of a male. But now we've found that actually it was a female Viking that we've actually uncovered. <laughs> so lots of areas of archaeology being rewritten. Um, archaeologists for some time have taken for granted that whatever evidence they see in the ground um, is as read. For example, <laughs> a woman's place is in the home and a man's place is out at work. In Viking society, that was in fact the scenario with one slight difference. If you were a woman who went off to fight, you were classed as a male. And if you were a man who worked in the home, you were classed as a female. Many men worked at home and they were classed as women because of the jobs that they did. In Viking society, in fact, women were the dominant of the two. Um, those were the ones that called the shots. So if you worked outside, you were a, a man, even if you were biologically a woman. If you worked inside, if you were biologically a man, you were classed as a female. Okay, so men outside, females inside whatever you were. But going back to this, um, I showed you uh, the image of a skull, um, the, the crania of a well-developed male, only for the females, because it's very difficult to um, work out, because we haven't got most of the rest of the brain, uh, the bone structure, uh, what exactly it is. Um, but we now know that these were actually used as to drink out of. Um, and this is all based upon the premise in prehistory that people didn't have a chance to mourn. So eating the flesh of a loved one was not only keeping that person alive inside you, was by carrying um, their skull around with you, you had the ability of remembering them as well. But there's also another very important reason why our ancestors <coughs> ate human flesh. It goes as follows. George, I'm picking on you. Oh. You've just died. Yeah. We're all in a cave. There's wolves outside. Your flesh is going to start to decay and smell if you're left for any period of time. Wolves would be attracted into the cave and your body will mean a threat to the rest of the group. So by us eating your flesh, the wolves outside will no longer be alerted. The bones are discarded or kept with you like the skull, but there's no rotten flesh. We have a meal. You're, met, you're remembered. The wolves are no threat to the community. And that, those are some of the reasons why we would eat George's flesh. And it's very important. It's a taboo in modern day society. Well, but back then. Flesh. Pardon? Well, that that is good. But I'm glad you raised that. Um, as we know, um, if you cook um, pork or beef on the bone, the meat just comes away from the bone. And if any of you have seen, it gets a bit more gory. Yeah. But it's okay. If any of you have seen um, Tudor Farm, uh, where Ruth, the lady in Tudor Farm, is sat there one day. And the camera's come in and she's just boiled a pig skull. Okay? She's just boiled a pig skull. And and the other others come in, they were supposed to be recreating history. They basically said, not eating that. She said, We're recreating Tudor life here. They would have eaten this, you know? Brawn. Exactly. We had brawn. We had pig. They would have eaten brawn. Exactly. Yeah. Brawn and 
Yeah. Yes, they would have eaten brawn. Like but the flesh itself, as it peeled away from the skin, mm. would make a nice soup as well. You You're going to say something. Please do. I can understand the eating of flesh in on survival consciousness, mm. but where is the evidence that this is a spiritual thing? I not said it's a spiritual thing. So this is just thought. Where is the evidence to suggest that you eat a human, your relatives eat that relative, would they use? Um, ethnography, modern day societies in Africa and South America, they still do it. In South America, there's a tribe, for example, when somebody dies in that tribe, they cremate the remains of that person, but the ashes they, they, they scoop up and they put it in a, into like a, a porridge, and then they eat that porridge, and that keeps the spirit of the person alive. In, 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 um, for example, we've got other, other evidence from Papua New Guinea. And this is very important. Can you remind me of the words day off in a short, short while? Okay? So in Papua New Guinea, they still do it today. Except there's a problem in Papua New Guinea. Can you all remember the outbreak of mad cow disease? Brain, brawn, eaten brain, sausages, and all the rest of it. Mm. There were cases of people being affected by some kind of brain disease. Okay? Remember all that. It's very important. And in, in, in Papua New Guinea, there was a tribe, and nobody, none of the ethnographers, archaeologists, paleontologists could work out why people in the tribe over a certain age, and they were male, were just dying off every time. Just dying off every time. Nobody could work it out. And then they, then they looked a bit further. They, somebody had died in the village, and they would remove the brain, and the males in the society would eat the brain. Okay? Um, and then... They worked it out. It was, there was a virus in the brain, um, a generic virus. So all the males would be eating it, and at a certain age, it would all die off because the virus would trigger. If there's one thing I know about viruses, they trigger. The dormant, typhus is dormant. It's got a dormancy of, uh, of a few weeks. Okay. Some some of the plagues have got dormancy. They they trigger. So when you eat eat the brain, nothing happens for a certain time in your biological growth. It triggers off you to um, have a, a, a system shutdown and a virus kills you. But it's a very successful virus because the virus knows that a new host is going to obtain the virus by eating the brain. Viruses are very intelligent. And when I, when I, when I did diseases, um, we, we particularly looked at uh, plagues. And at, at the time of the, the very, very great, horrific plague, which hit Wales, hit England, Bristol, Southampton, in, in, in 1348, and died out in 1352, there were three strains of plague, bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. Pneumonic and bubonic were successful plagues, because if you, some people who got pneumonic or bubonic plague would survive, so they could pass it on. And there'd be outbreaks of pneumonic and bubonic plague every few years, all the way until about the 1500s. Every four or five years, there'd be a new outbreak. But there was another strain of that plague, uresis pestis. There was a third strain, strain C. Strain C had a killer rate of 100%. So it was not successful virus at all. It was unsuccessful because it killed all the hosts. Viruses are highly intelligent. And the highly intelligent brain disease on Papua New Guinea triggered so that the males could reproduce. And as soon as the men had reproduced, had several children, they say would have a system shut down and it would kill them. Successful virus. So, um, with all that said, <coughs> where's that um, cue? What, what did I say? Yeah. This, is, this is a really interesting thing. You know, um, you know the idea that we have, um, you know the idea that we celebrate somebody's life and we have a week, okay? Um, or we have a day off for our birthday. It could be something really ancient. If you're living in a society that is really harsh, you've got a small community. Human populations in the Paleolithic period over 12,000 years ago. Had to, have, had to have a mean total of about 15 to 20 individuals in the group to survive. If there's anything under that, two or three people dying in a group, it's catastrophic. It could wipe out the, the family completely. Okay? 
So if you go out hunting, it's dangerous. You can die hunting. A pack of wolves, one of those wolves in a pack being hit by the hoof of a horse, the wolf could be paralyzed and it will die. Hunting is dangerous for humans as well. And to have a day off from hunting was wonderful. So if you had a member of your family who would die, you could have a day off. You could eat the brawn, you could eat the flesh, you could eat the marrow, it would give you a day off. And this is where the idea of having a day off awake may actually come from. That ancient sense that you could absorb the person's soul by eating their flesh and having a day off. And you could say, thank you very much for giving me one day off from hunting. You've given me one more day of life by your sacrifice. And I can live one more day. And that is a gift in itself. The gift of life. Death gives the gift of life. Um, interesting enough, we know that they're de-skinning they're de -skinning the skulls as well. They're not, they're not just gnawing at the bones. They're de-skinning the skulls. Um, so it's obviously flesh on the skull itself. Um, the concept of defleshing bones is something that was reenacted by the Germans and the SS in the Second World War. Himmler was such a nice bloke. He would have um, flesh stretched over frames to create uh, lampshades. He was such a nice man that he used human long bones to create a chair. This experiment in human flesh and bones is nothing new, but this was for real. This was survival. This was important. And I've got to say, I've seen it done, not with humans, but I've seen it done where, 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 where a brain, I've seen somebody do it, um, at St. Fountain's, they had an open day one day, it was to, I think the workshop was Tatana Skin, right? So they had a rat and <coughs> the brain of the rat. You could see somebody doing this. Um, and that, that, the brain itself, had the proteins and oils to, to tan the skin of the rat. And they did it. And they, 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 and obviously the rat skin produced a leather. Um, and as it's said, <coughs> that if you use uh, the brawn of the human brain is enough to tan a complete human skin. And we know that because we've got records of it from the Second World War. So this is not science fiction. This is science fact. Whether they were using the skin to create clothing is a bit beyond what I'm doing today. It's got no evidence of that. But what we do have evidence, you can't see it, but you've got cut marks here where they're actually taking the skin off the skull, which is really, really important. And we know this, again, from other societies in the world that still practice this. So we've got more than one body. We've got several bodies that are being processed in this way. So what I'm going to do... Um, here we go, back to me again. And um, I, I, I was not able to keep the dress at all. Not not at all. I only turn up in a dress around the house. The, the archaeologists um, that were excavating these skulls, um, they had been on, in store for 20 years. And after being in store for 20 years, they were starting to realize that there was something really weird about the whole collection. It was a bit much to say that, in fact, animals had been responsible for gnawing at these bones and they started to uh, they started to look at the long bones 
and human teeth, if any of you have watched the bill or anything like that, you will know that human teeth leave a certain mark. If you've ever seen the bill, they would always trace a criminal by finding an apple core and match up that apple core to the CSI. person's teeth. Yes, yeah. CSI. And they worked out that the signatures left on the bones themselves were signatures of the teeth of a human being. So this was, this was revolutionary. This was something different that archaeologists have been trying to find for a long time. Has any of you ever actually been to Danarogov cave system? Did you know there's bone cave there with a whole collection of human bones? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen it? Yeah, but I've never seen it. I never lived there. Um, no, I, 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 I don't think you would have gone in there holding those long bones. Did you actually touch any of those no. bones? Did you get that close? No. You just saw it? Yeah, I've been there a few times. Just a glimpse around the corner. Yeah. Well, it, it said it said that the, the collection of human bones at Danarogov may be evidence of cannibalization. They may be evidence that people had just been chucked um, down into a hole and just left. Um, they say any signs of um, gnawing marks at the bones are in fact signs of a wolf doing it. But it might be because they're being discarded... Um, because the flesh had been taken off and the marrows had been taken out and the flesh had be, been made very, very useful. Talk, talking about the full Im implications of all this, um, the, the idea uh, of carrying a human skull around with you um, in remembrance of a loved one is back to something that I mentioned a little while ago. In modern day society, um, we're given time to mourn our loved ones. We can take time off work, we can still feed ourselves, family will look after our, us, and so on and so on. But in the Paleolithic period, people simply didn't have that great luxury. So to eat the flesh and to keep the bones with you was a sense of honouring those individuals. And as I say, these practices are undertaken even today in certain parts of the world. <coughs> so what I want to do there um, is take a little bit of a break. Um, I can do some articles of the week. And we can come, come to a little bit more of this after the break, because this is all too much to take in. Um, and then we'll also do the Lady of Pavland. So we'll do some things that sort of relate to cannibalism and Paleolithic archaeology, but doing it from a completely different <coughs> angle. And I've got some wonderful articles of the week here. Um, and these are all from our Landsrip Major gang. It goes as follows. It's Eric the Red, Viking warrior who was a woman. When one thinks of a Viking, the image of a tough Norseman at the helm of a longship comes to mind, no doubt on his way to do a spot of pillaging. But a historical picture will have to be rewritten after one of the best preserved graves of a Viking warrior, buried with full honours, including two horses, a sword and armour piercing arrows, was found to in fact contain a woman. For years the warrior was assumed to be a man, until DNA analysis by researchers at Stockholm realised that it wasn't in fact a man at all, it was in fact a woman. One of the researchers said that someone who worked with tactics and strategy maybe could lead troops in battle, was given a fitting grave. The grave itself was also set up with gaming pieces and a board game, and a board itself for the gaming pieces. Although women are said not to accompany men on voyages, especially to colonise new lands, they were usually buried with household items such as needlework and jewellery. This changes everything. The warrior was buried um, at a place called Burka um, in Sweden. Isotope analysis confirmed a, a woman 
with a very strict, strict lifestyle. Somebody who was itinerant, somebody who was warrior class, well in tune with the warlike society that dominated Northern Europe at the time. The archaeologist who led the study said the burial site had been excavated in 1880. And it was always assumed that this individual was in fact a man. So archaeologists getting things wrong. This is, this is really important when we look at the Lady of Pavlan Cave. Where the Lady of Pavlan Cave, another Paleolithic story today, because we are doing prehistory and Paleolithic archaeology. The Lady of Pavlan today, even after their discovery in 1823, is still referred to as the Lady of Pavlan Cave even though it was found out in 1912 there was in fact a man. Things in archaeology take a long time to change. Women will, will be seen, and will be seen for a very long time, to be the subservient class in society. But they are not that at all. A little bit more about this article. Maybe a woman that looked like that. It says a little bit more about this. Um, not, just a, um, not just any old warrior. It is exciting because the traditional images of Vikings are masculine and war-hungry. Men. With the women at home baking or looking after the children. <coughs> this burial is clearly of a high-status woman. The fact that she's buried with weapons indicate this. She's a warrior. The female Viking warrior is a familiar figure in popular culture. But to actually find the evidence is very, very rare. Because it was assumed that the individual was found with weapons, it must be a man. This is a classic mistake of archaeologists. Archaeologists make this mistake quite often. When we do that, we're just reproducing the past in our own image. And what that simple, simply means, we still can't get around the fact that women were more important in the past than we ever give them credit for. Now, there's a little story that um, Nigel and Glenda, you may not have heard, but the other four of you have, that there was um, an archaeological excavation a few years ago. Um, there was a body excavated and had all the um, blacksmithing tools there. Um, and there was a hammer and an anvil, an Iron Age burial. And the archaeologist come along and said, it's definitely a man. It's definitely a man. Look at the robust structure. Another archaeologist come along and said, um, it's a woman. Oh, well, if it's a woman, uh, and we can prove it's a woman, yeah, we've proven it's a woman, therefore, that all the blacksmithian tools must have been her father's. <laughs> and most archaeologists went with that, and some other archaeologists, some savvy archaeologists like me, reading the article and putting it together, said, um, have you seen the bone structure? The bone structure is, is of a structure of somebody that wielded a hammer and was actually a smithy. Oh, but that must be because she cleaned floors or something. And in fact, you look at another piece of evidence from the, Second World, from the First World War. Um... All, all, these, all these men going off to fight, leaving the women behind. And the fairies, the fairies in the blacksmithies are actually producing the horseshoes for the horses. Um, the suddenly overnight, um, metal working, nails are being produced by these blacksmithies, um, by somebody who, who couldn't be a woman. And you go back and you look at that, it must be that the women were doing the blacksmithing before the men went. Because there's no way you could learn blacksmithing without knowing how to do it. You can't just go off and leave women behind and expect women to learn the skills of blacksmithing. I know women are really highly intelligent, men are highly intelligent. Let's try it this way, right? Um, I can knit, right? Can you knit, Robert? Okay, if I give you a few needles and some wool, knit me a jumper, go on. I don't think you would either. The point, the point is with all this, is that the women were the blacksmiths. The women were, did all these things. But because 
this masculine image, and you had these se the census of 1911. There were no female blacksmiths. But then their husbands went off to war. They were doing the blacksmithing. Can I ask you something? Go for it. Blacksmithing is a skill that has got to be learned over time as an apprentice, etc. Yes. Now, I'm not disputing the fact that a woman can become a blacksmith, but wouldn't, how would that woman have had her training? She would must have. Off her dad. It would have been off the, off, off, off the husband, off the dad. Right. It, they yeah. must have. They must have. They couldn't but, just take over. They couldn't just take, there's no yeah. way. There's no way. For, for example, I, um, Michelle said to me before she, we went to Shetland, this, this is this is Link. She said, right, can you plumb the new toilet in, right? Because I've plumbed a toilet before and I've done another one and I've watched my dad how to do it, right? Um, I, I took all the a toilet out and I thought, you know, I, I panicked. I thought, right, but I can do this because I've seen it done. I know how to do it. My dad done it. I, I plumbed the toilet. And lo and behold, right, I fix it all up. There's no leaks anymore. I plumbed the toilet. It's flushing. It's working fine, right? And Anna made the stupid mistake, and I said, oh, Michelle, you could have done this. She said, no, I can't. And I said, of course you could have. It was bloody easy. But I, I forgot all the rules of what I've just said. It's not easy. You can't just plumb in a toilet. You can't just um, do this and that and all the rest of it. It couldn't be a kind of family tradition. Yeah, so, so this is really important. And this is why we get so many things wrong in the past. That's one article of the week, okay? One article of the week. Here's another one. It's, it's one of those weird weeks. Uh, humans reached Australia up to 80,000 years ago, not 47,000 years ago. A groundbreaking archaeological discovery in northern Australia has extended the known length of time Aboriginal people have inhabited the continent, continent to at least 65,000 years. The findings on about 11,000 artefacts show indigenous people have been in Australia for far longer than previous estimates of between 47 and 60,000 years. The researchers said some of the artefacts could be as old as 80,000 years. I, I'm going to sound really racist now. Those I mean, backwards aborigines, right? There's no way they could have got there. Um, you know, they, they just didn't have the skills to do it, you know? They wouldn't, and all the and this is the old image of Aborigines. They couldn't have done cave art or anything because they're just too backwards. There's no way could they have done it. They could, there's no way could they have got to Australia. Some of these bad stereotypes are still there. But when you actually look logically, Aboriginal Australians got there 80,000 years ago. They did the cave art. They did the paintings. They actually got there. They actually got there by boat. Aboriginals making boats? Oh, terrible. But they did. They did make boats and they did, did get there. They were highly advanced to get there, Australia, in the first place. The researchers um, upends uh, decades-old estimates about the colonisation of Australia. Human interactions with megafauna and a dispersal of modern humans from Africa and across South Asia. People got here much earlier than we thought, which means, of course, they must also have left Africa much earlier. Or, in fact... Evolution came from somewhere else, and not just Africa, when I was starting to think China. It also means the time of overlap with the megafauna is much longer than originally thought, maybe as much as 25,000 years. So you had these huge beasts in Australia, and they're living alongside these aboriginals. Um, one of the archaeologists said that they processed this site, and they just got all these artefacts. The artefacts themselves were uncovered in what's known as zone of first occupation. 11,000 artefacts with axes um, and materials and ochres and paints dating back nearly 80,000 years. Again, that knocks out the stereotypes of the Aboriginals. And to be honest with you, there's so much to be said about those two articles, but there's another one. It's slightly different. But this article ain't, and this is this is part of my golden Bible now. I'm one of those archaeologists that still believes, and I've got a nice article there, that the Preseli stones got to Stonehenge by glacial movement, not the nonsense of being transferred there by human beings. 
Yeah, here we go. One point six billion pound tunnel to let you drive under Stonehenge. Controversial plans to build a one point eight mile road tunnel under Stonehenge were given the go ahead yesterday. The scheme is intended to hide the sound and sight of the road from the monument site. Following consultation, plans had been altered so that the tunnel entrance would not spoil the view of the sun during the winter solstice. But experts warned the £1.6 billion project uh, would still compromise the um, utterly precious archaeological site. How can you spend £1.6 billion on an under two mile length of road? It's, in, it's, taken, it's nearly cost them £50 million to consult over the £50 million. In, in anywhere else, right? what they would have done, they would have diverted the road somewhere else, as they do everywhere else. You don't put a road directly through Cardiff or Manchester or anywhere like that. You take it around the side and you move traffic away from the problem. You don't put it directly underneath. The A307 is often gridlocked. Yeah, I know. Why don't they? Why did, haven't they done something about it? Quicker journey times, reducing congestion, and cleaner air will benefit people locally and unlock growth in the tourist industry. I don't think it will. Uh, the Department for Transport officials claim it will avoid important archaeological sites and will not spoil the view of the setting sun. Thousands of people and organisations responded to a public consultation. Time Team presenter Tony Robinson had previously described the scheme as old-fashioned because it assumes that what needs to be protected is that little clump of stone. It's the landscape that needs to be protected. He said the stone circle was invaluable, but over the past 20 to 30 years, experts had begun to appreciate that the area around it was a complex uh, network of henges, pathways, barrows and trackways. Um, uh, the Stonehenge landscape is um, utterly precious and you tamper with it at your peril. And before we have a break now, listen to this. Stonehenge. When's this dated? This is, uh, this I do believe is um, from the Western Mail. And it's dated within the past few days. It goes as follows. The glacial effect. At Stonehenge, there are 43 blue stones, eight are long pillars, and the rest are stumps, slabs, and boulders from at least 20 locations. They are heavily weathered and worn, and look just like a, a, su a, a suite of glacial erratics, rocks that differ from the surrounding rocks, believed to have been brought from a distance by glacial action. We've got sites like that around here. Harewood Farm, which is very near here, and St. Mary's Hill as glacial stone directly on top of it today. The altar stone, which isn't an altar stone, was an upright stone, is believed to have come from the Brecon Beacons. And the other blue stones are from the rocky outcrops on the northern flank of Preseli. Geological research shows that the dolerite blue stones have not come from Khan Meni, as previously thought, but from Khan Kodong and its related tools in West Wales. Some of the broken rock debris in the soil at Stonehenge has come from Craig Ross Bellin area, another site. Archaeologists have argued that there are Neolithic bluestone quarries at these three sites, but their cited evidence does not bear scrutiny, and earth scientists say the so-called engineering features are entirely natural. The Irish Sea glaciers, which inundated um, Pembrokeshire twice during the Ice Age, are also reached. Uh, the Isles of Scilly and Cross across the coast of Cornwall, Devon and Somerset. We do not know if the glacier reached Stonehenge, but the established direction of ice movement are exactly right for blue stones to have been picked up and transported. There are many other glacial erratics in South West England, other blue stones in South West England, strangely enough. Um, in contrast, there is no physical or radiocarbon dating evidence to support or either um, any support for Neolithic quarry in Pembrokeshire or stone transport by human beings rest my case and it keeps coming up and up and up now, the latest theory was it took they, they, uh, our human ancestors um, took 500 years to move the blue stones all the way across the land up through wooded landscapes 
all the way up to the top of the Brecon Beacons, back down again, up through the boggy landscape of the River Severn, back through all the way up through some more mountains, all the way back through some more boggy landscapes, all the way to the um, all the way to Stonehenge, um, over a period of 500 years. Do they land like that? Yeah. What? Oh right, no, th those those are not those those are um, sandstone stones. Oh. The blue stones, they're the little ones, oh, little girly ones. Right, what we're going to do? We're going to take a break. Uh, my bloody tea's gone cold, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, we're going to take a break, and um, we'll be back after the break. Uh, Nigel, was this well worth the wait? Sorry? Was this well worth the wait? Well, to see me. <laughs> Well, I didn't know you were going to be with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're Oh, Georgie, we missed you. Yeah. Right, so we managed to um, we managed to get through most of this piece. Um, I had internet um, problems before the break, but this whole revelation about cannibalism, um, this idea of cannibalism, caveman, this is 15,000 years ago. 15,000 years ago is 3,000 years before the ice starts to melt. Um, and the analysis of these remains of Goth's cave in Somerset has provided new evidence of a sophisticated culture of uh, butchery and carving up human remains. That even sounds heinous in itself. Uh, but I think what the archaeologists are trying to get across is that it's taken 20 years for them to really understand what these bones are about. They were found alongside the remains of other um, animals, flint, bone, antler, and ivory artifacts. It's also said that when some of these bones had been gnawed at and the flesh disconnected, uh, the bones are simply tossed away. Uh, we've now got wonderful radiocarbon dates um, for these bones, and we understand that this activity was taking place approximately 14,700 years ago. The human remains have been the subject of several studies. In a previous study, we could determine that the cranial bones, the head bone, uh, had been carefully modified to make skull cups, uh, which is that image that I've already shown you. During this research, however, we've identified a far greater degree of human modification than recorded um, in earlier studies. Here we go. We found um, undoubted evidence of defleshing, disarticulation, human chewing of bones, crushing of the spongy bones, the head bones of, for children, uh, the, heads, the, the, the heads of the long bones like the humerus and the ulna, um, and the cracking of bones to extract the marrow. Um, this it's described as a mortuary practice, a burial practice. It's more, it's more described as something else, a respectful practice. Our present analysis of the skull bones has identified far greater degree um, than had ever been recorded. 
of cannibalism. Hang on, I'm going to need to call a bit. Hello. teeth marks on many of the um, bones themselves provides evidence uh, for cannibalism. A reoccurring theme for of this period is a remarkable rarity of burials. This is, this is the next point. Throughout large tracts of prehistory, we don't actually find human remains. Um, there's a period in the Iron Age where you've got the sophistication of settlements, agriculture, buildings, banks and ditches, communication, and even in the later Iron Age, um, coinage. There's a whole period in the Iron Age where we don't know where the bodies went. We can, we, can't, we can only guess. But we've got answers here, what was happening with some of the bodies in the Paleolithic period. Um, and the rarity of these burials is that there's cannibalism being practiced. Uh, commonly, any bones that are found, however, they're found in the rubbish. They're found uh, with other animal bones. And other archaeologists used to think this was really disrespectful, but it's not disrespectful. Uh, there's one thing that I've, I've seen in archaeology that is, that is very important, this reoccurring theme of our ancestors um, remembering people in other ways, because they can't simply do what we do in modern-day society, take, take a year off, um, or mourn that person for the rest of our lives and so on and so on, like Queen Victoria did. Queen Victoria mourned for many years because she was able to. You wouldn't have been able, you wouldn't have been able to do that in Paleolithic society. Instead, in Paleolithic society, they kept people alive by um, eating their flesh or making skull cups. Even in a Victorian period, however, when somebody died, they, they shaved the person's hair off and made them into bracelets and stuff. It's the same thing. Cannibalism is the same thing. Mm -hmm. You may think today that um, keeping somebody's hair with you um, of somebody that died a few years ago is not good, right? You can have the ashes made into rings now. Some, people would, some people would feel that was terrible. But I, I feel it's fine. I think it's great. Uh, Glenda, this is a completely different area, but why is it in Britain uh, we... Somebody dies one week, the next week we bury them, and then we, then we have psychotherapy and we just forget them. It just, in, in the past, they, they had... We don't forget them, though. But, but that's what we're told. In this, soci in this society, uh, I had a whole lecture of this in my university. My lecturer said, why is it in the past they, they, used, to, they used to relate to their loved ones much more closely than we do today? Um, in this society, we bury somebody and we're, we're meant to forget them. In the past... Uh, they, 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 they kept the person alive. For example, the point I was going to come on to next was Neolithic um, causeway enclosures. What we find in causeway enclosures is all these, all these banks and ditches, an array of ditches in a circle, and each family had one of those ditches. They'd put their loved one's bones into that ditch, and then when they'd moved away, they'd take all their bones with them and take them somewhere else. Other, other ones, they, they might say, right, our loved one's at the bottom of the ditch, now we'll put some other material in them. It might be all mixed up, but that's respect for that person. They're being deposited properly. And it's the same thing here. For except the odd long bone is found in the rubbish, that indicates that the other bones are dealt with in a very different way than normal burial. Further analysis along the lines used to study Goss Cave will help to understand other sites um, that are in Paleolithic origin. 
And one of those sites that we're going to look at in Paleolithic, uh, to, to date back to the Paleolithic period, 33,000 years ago, is the Lady of Pavilion Cave. So that's where we're go going to go on to now. Um, so here we go. There, that's that. Here we go. Pavilion Cave. On the Gower. Basically, this, this cave here is, is basically only accessible for about one hour a day, one or two hours a day because, because of the tide there. Uh, and there's, there's a 20 meter um, hole leading into a, known as a blowhole. This was, this was formed by the sea, but we'll, we'll look at a little bit more detail in a minute. But this is Powerland Cave. I, I know I say every week, you know, I sit here and I turn around and say, this is the most important discovery ever made in archaeology, right? We didn't do it this week, but last week I did, and the week before there was another article. Actually, the Lady of Pavlan Cave was in fact one of the most important discoveries in archaeology relating to um, the time before 12,000 years ago, to a period we don't know much about. So Pavlan Cave is on the Gower. Um, it's, it's, it's on the far end of the Gower. Uh, and this is, this is basically going into the cave. This is set in the scene. Um, and this is the wonderful um, plan of the site. When I say wonderful, this is the best that we get. Um, the excavations of Pavlan Cave uh, were, were undertaken by a geologist who didn't believe in evolution in 1823. He believed in Bishop Usher's work in the 1600s that the earth... Um, the Earth was created in the year 4004 years BC, um, and obviously around then you had these these monsters and things known as dinosaurs, dragons and beasts, and all the rest of it mentioned in the Bible. All that happened uh, in the space of about 6,000 years. He, Reverend Buckland uh, was not one of those who believed in um, Darwinism, which wouldn't occur for about another 60 odd years. He believed. Uh, but the earth was very, very new. And with that, when he excavated this cave, he brought all that information with him and basically said that the finds at Paviland related to a period no more than 2,000 years ago. In fact, 1,600 years ago. Not 33,000 years ago, as we now know. Uh, looking at this wonderful cave, a few, few weird things with antiquarian plants. He, he took a week to excavate the cave. An archaeologist, an archaeological team would probably take about 10 years to excavate this cave now. It was done in one single week. Um, and the archaeological or antiquarian thinking back then was really mucked up because he was a geologist. Um, the thinking when excavating caves then was if it didn't look relevant, it would just go over the edge of it. And when it went over the edge, it went simply into the sea. Uh, so, so this, this world important archaeological site was excavated in 1823 on the 18th of January and it was boldly discovered on the 27th of December 1822. Uh, it was a right balls up, really. Oh, and also there's another, there's so much about this story. When Reverend Buckland, when he got back to Oxford, right, he had a mammoth skull the size of this desk, right? Huge mammoth skull with tusks. Right, and he put it on his desk, and the next day it wasn't there. And he wrote in his report, I put it on the desk and it must have fallen off. I couldn't find it. He lost it in his office. And do you know what? They're still trying to find this mammoth skull even today. Uh, yeah. Someone <laughs> had to. I, I think what happened, it fell, it fell through yeah, a crack somewhere. What's that? It probably. Exactly. Somebody would have somebody would have pulled it. Anyway, the point is, with, with these with these plans from the early 1800s, um, by a geologist um, doing an antiquarian excavation, it's a bit like an actor doing lectures involved in archaeology. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. And when he drew this plan. He, he showed uh, a fully articulated, in other words, a body that hadn't been interfered with, uh, with a skull, uh, arm bones, leg bones, uh, ribs, and all the rest of it. He showed it all intact, 
which would be found there. That's a section. It's there. Skull there. Big skull. Um, other um, internments along there. All these different layers with all these different bones and he showed all that. But in fact, the human remains that um, were excavated uh, did not involve the finding of a skull. In fact, he made up the fact that he found a skull. But even if he had found a skull, he may have mistaken it for something else and he chucked it over the edge. I'm not a fan of Reverend uh, Buckland at all. Because he probably did, doesn't he? He, may, he? he probably just discarded it. But the problem is that there was other pottery and all sorts of things found in there for much later periods. Okay, we're talking about the Paleolithic period. But it was all discarded because it wasn't seen as being relevant. Uh, fortunately, enough of the bones survived, and enough of some of the artifacts survived to give us something of a picture, which I'm going to want, which I'm going to read out. Um, those that uh, know my classes and have been here before, which is none of you, um, what is wrong about this plan? What is wrong about this artist's impression? What is wrong about this illustration? What's going on here? Well, you can't choose a seed to the opening for care. Uh, that's actually that's actually one thing that is accurate there is that the sea then was 75, 75 miles away, so you wouldn't have been able to see the sea anyway. What is wrong with this? It's got a skull. Um, the, probably when the person was buried, most people oh, do have skulls. Yeah, that's right. Um, oh, yeah, they got fired. Are they all alive? Well, okay, okay. What, what I'm trying to get at is, is the illustration is based on the archaeology now, right? The Carboniferous rock would have eroded away quite considerably over the past 33,000 years as the sea inundated the landscape around uh, 6,000 years directly at the tower um, as the sea managed to get to that part of the coast. That's what's wrong about it. Um, you, 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 what, what? What you said there about the sea and all the rest of it, the sea was about 75 miles away. Um, and the other thing that is actually wrong with this, and this is something, I, I've read the reports about this, um, and it says um, that the the ochre um, stains the bones. Okay, the ochre stains the bones, right? If you're going to bury a body and the ochre is then spread on the flesh, Flesh is going to react with the ochre and it's just going to wash away into the soil. It's not going to stain the bones. I believe. That's it. Every other, every archaeological. You, you've seen it and I haven't even said it. Every archaeological report says this is why archaeologists get things wrong. Archaeologists do. Lots of archaeologists do the easy way out. Okay. Um, the easy way out is to basically say the person was buried, articulated, and ochre was placed on them, um, and then somehow the ochre impregnated into um, the fine the fine cells, um, the vesicles in, in the bone structure and all the rest of it, and the ochre stained the bone. No, the, 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 it was laid out, it rotted away, the bones were um, articulated, and then the ochre was then added to the bones, and that's why the bones are stained red. Because the ochre itself has to be added to the bones, not placed onto the flesh, and then it makes its way down to the bones. That's one. Th that's another thing they got wrong. Um, there, there you go. You can see how stained the bones are. Unfortunately, uh, this looks like a giant. It's the way the image has been taken. Um, you've got the phalanges. Um, you've got the... Um, the carpals. Uh, you've got the leg bones, uh, you've got the pelvis, you've got one side, and you've got the uh, rib bones, um, and you've got the spinal column, but without the skull. Okay, And that, that's basically what they found. But what they also found as well, uh, what they also found as well, um, were wonderful ivory rods. 50 ivory rods. And what we're going to do now, we're going to cut that, and we're gonna, I'm going to go over to my notes, um, and we're not going to we're not going to allow uh, wonderful Glenda to say anything else. She's not allowed to because Glenda's been told off. Because you're a very naughty girl.
and what have you in pale? Oh, yes. Oh, shit. Uh, I'm going to remind everybody, yeah. Glenda is related to a no, certain... No, don't tell anyone. A certain... Uh, it's a secret. Nigel, just you, Vlad, who impales <coughs> the impaler. Oh. Vlad, oh. the impaler. The edges of pretend. Yeah, right. Pavilion Cave and the Red Lady of Pavilion, one of the most famous caves in the world. And actually, I'd agree with that one. For its archaeological finds in the 1820s. The entrance, uh, a mere 10 metres high by 7 metres wide, so it's a very large entrance, um, which actually goes through solid. Carboniferous rock, which was formed 350 million years ago. Uh, it's otherwise known as what's my favourite animal? Goat's Goat. hole. Goat. Yeah. Uh, the cave was formed by the sea when uh, sea levels were much higher. Um, as I mentioned last week, um, Britain has been in and out of Europe many, many times. So the Brexit vote to leave Europe is nothing new. One day Britain will be back in Europe. Yay. But probably with a land bridge between the two as the, as all as it's we go into a global freezing event. Um, but anyway, moving on. Uh, within the chamber, daylight gleams from the chimney or the blowhole formed from the sea. Because what would happen is the water itself would smash into the rocks, and when it when it managed to get into some kind of fissure, it keeps smashing into the fissure, and the water would go up through the rock creating a blowhole. Um, and this would illuminate the cave. Major excavations there in 1822, 1823, and 1912. It's in 1912 the archaeologist turned up and he thought, bloody hell, there's hardly anything here to analyse. The problem with this is the, this is the problem with uh, archaeology. Archaeological work is destructive. Whenever you excavate a hill fort along the coast, you've got to destroy the beautiful um, biodiversity and the bio uh, flora underneath all the roots go into all the wonderful archaeology below and when you remove that the landscape becomes destable and the archaeology erodes away and that's exactly what happened at goat's hole cave up until that point all the archaeology was really intact all all um it hadn't been impregnated by the sea it was all compacted as soon as it started to become loosened the sea water would quite easily get in there and just erode it away goat's hole was first discovered um, by accident, when a Mr. Dillwyn and a certain Miss Talbot of Penrhys were visiting the cave. And it said through their actions, they found... <laughs> through their actions, they found some bone. Interested by the discoveries made here, the Reverend William... Buckland re-excavated the cave the following year, on the 18th of January, as you all know. The discovery was made on the 27th of December, worth noting. It was during a secondary and more substantial exploration over one single week, um, which led um, to Reverend Buckland, Professor of Geology at Oxford, the first ever Professor of Geology at Oxford, to make the resounding conclusion that... It was, in fact, the Red Lady. He was also a devout Christian, and it was this fact that led Buckley, Buckland um, into not recognising the full importance of his find. Buckland believed that no human remains could be dated earlier than the Great Flood. Misguided by the Bible preconception, the dating of this, uh, the skeletal remains was drastically inaccurate. Modern tests have dated the remains to an amazing 33,000 years ago. The remains uncovered by Buckland consist of a whole side of the skeleton without the skull with red ochre impregnated into the bone. 
the body was found um, with bones of other animals, antler and ivory. Perforated seashell necklaces also accompanied the body. And this is why this links in with the, the articles I've read out. So if you found seashell, um, a seashell necklace, basically they didn't find the thread, they actually found uh, little seashells, okay, periwinkles, um, adorning the neck. What would that indicate, male or female? Female. See, you've just made the classic mistake. That's exactly what Reverend Buckland presumed. This is the mistakes that archaeologists make all the time. They look at the artefact. There are so many male Romans found with jewellery, and archaeologists have mistaken them for women. This is the problem. Um, and Buck, the, the body itself, uh, itself was found with mainly de decorative items that led Buckland to identify the skeleton as a female and probably a Roman prostitute or a witch. Yeah, yeah, just move on. This <laughs> misidentification of the, the skeleton plus the red staining of its bones by the red ochre that had been sprinkled over the body at the time of burial. Can you see there that the red staining of the bones and then they're saying it was sprinkled over the body at the time of burial? Well, obviously, the bones must have been uh, without flesh to be stained in the first place. Um, hence being coined the Red Lady of Pavilion. A large mammoth skull also uncovered at the site in which marked the site of the burial was later finished. No, it was lost in his office. It's probably around at the back of a book somewhere. A, a further excavation of the Goat's Hall Pavilion and a re examination of the Red Lady of Pavilion's skeleton was made in 1912 by a Professor Solus. Armed with more scientific means of dating and I identifying the remains of Buckland's earlier discovery, Solus identified the Red Lady as, in fact, a male and dated it to the Stone Age. So we've got some sense. In total, finds at Goat's Hole also included over, over 4,000 worked flints, animals' teeth, pitcher and Lloyd George, necklace, <laughs> bones, stone needles, and mammoth ivory bracelets. These can be viewed at a number of localities. Swansea Museum, National Museum of Wales, and the bones themselves are still owned by Oxford Museum, and so they shall there remain for the time being, until we actually sort out our damnable museums in Wales. They have been loaned to Wales a number of times and have been placed on display in the National Museum of Wales. There's a campaign to get the bones rehoused in Wales, but who's going to pay for that? There's, there's, um, skeleton remains of the Red Lady of Pavilion, as it is still fondly known, is now recognised as belonging to one of the earliest um, orders of modern man. In fact, it's one of the er earliest sets of skeletal remains uh, in the whole western part of Europe. It's almost completely Except for the skull. Sure, yeah. And loads of, yeah. Any. Um, put, it, put it this way, it was done so badly that yeah, if it was done yeah. properly, pro uh, Properly, probably the whole skull uh, would have been found. Nothing His bones, as, what's that? Nothing, nothing else been found in that field since, um, Not really, because all the stuff has been washed away. His bones are still receiving scientific uh, attention. Some more information. The Red Lady of Pavlan died no earlier than his 21st year of life and had hitherto been a rather healthy person. During his life, Britain, which was still attached to the rest of Europe at the time, had a rather different climate to that experience today. With cool summers but very harsh winters, its climate can be approximated to that currently experiences Scandinavia. But you would have had green tundra plains in the summer that mammoths would have grazed upon. The Bristol Channel was just a shallow river with uh, meandering through the very rich hunting grounds of Paviland. From this river, it can be speculated the Red Lady of Paviland fished to supplement his diet. This addition of fish to his diet, as proven by recent studies of the Red Lady's skeleton, marked a modern man apart from the Neanderthals, who did not vary their diet from, sta from the staple of meat and grain. But I don't think that's fair, because um, we now know uh, that 
uh, there's, there's a number of Neand Neanderthal genes in some of us, particularly me, um, and some others in the room, particularly those with red hair, Pat. Um, and Neanderthals, we know, in, um, interbred with human beings, and therefore Neanderthals didn't become completely extinct. But the point is, is that Neanderthals um, would as adaptable to change as modern day humans are. Um, so that's why Neanderthals as a pure species died out. Uh, but Neanderthals are still amongst us today, but they've obviously bred with modern day humans. The fact that the Red Lady could vary uh, their diet gives uh, uh, that wonderful piece of evidence and it shows through the bone structure what I've just said. Although no clothing was discovered with the Red Lady, it has been established that the pe people of his time wore and adorned clothes and would often wear periwinkle necklaces as fashion pieces. Now that last point's really interesting. Can you remember going to school? All people before 12,000 years ago were, were wandering around in the ice completely stark naked. Can you remember those images? Yeah. Right. Now, just one quick point. Some of the average temperatures back then were minus 20 or minus 40 degrees C, and that was even in the summer. If a bloke complete, wandered out there completely stark naked, the first thing would fall off wouldn't be his fingers. One knock against a piece of wood, he wouldn't be able to reproduce children anymore. So therefore, that's why um, um, saying being adorned clothing, and you know, it's really important. And it's said that to create a complete set of clothes um, would have been the equivalent of killing about um, eight wild boars because you would have needed um, an under overgarment, undergarment, leggings and all the rest of it to keep you warm. But that's what they say. Honing skins, about eight to create one, one set of clothing for one individual. But that's another story altogether. Um, the, the Lady of Pavlan Cave was actually found... Um, with weird little carved bone sticks. Um, and it's thought that um, the individual was some kind of shaman. It is believed that the Red Lady's grave um, um, was dedicated to somebody who seemingly, by all accounts, may have had magical powers because they almost had 50-odd bone-carved wands found on the body. Person of significance during their life, his fame also continues after death. Here's being one of the oldest datable modern human remains discovered um, in the United Kingdom and the oldest um, known burial in Western Europe. So that's quite, a, it's quite an important thing, really. You know, um, this is 33,000 years ago. We started off with cannibalism. Those bodies in that, in, within those contexts, those four of them in particular, were from about um, 15,000 years ago. So before 15,000 years ago, you've got this burial, and more or less 15,000 years later, they're eating human flesh. So, um, you know, that says a lot in itself. Anyway, what I'm going to do is actually give you some fascinating dates uh, about the radiocarbon dating. The radiocarbon dating is a story in itself. So we, know, so we can establish um, 33,000 um, 33, uh, years ago, the body's was radiocarbon dated. Um, and here we go. Yeah, here we go. Um, on the 27th of December, it was found by Mary Theresa Talbot with a friend whilst they were wandering around the cave. Friend. Dorothy, don't look at me that way. It's frightening me. Uh, later that year, writing about his find in his book, Reliquie de Louvre, which means evidence of the flood, Buckland, in 1823, said as follows, I found the skeleton enveloped by a coating of a kind of ruddle, um, that's basically red ochre, which stained the earth and in some parts extended itself to the distance of about um, half um, an inch around the surface of the bones. Close to that part of the thigh bone uh, where the pocket is usually worn, surrounded also by ruddle, ochre, about two handfuls of periwinkle shells. Um, so in other words, he had a pouch with periwinkles. And an, another part of the skeleton, in contact with the ribs, 40 or 50 fragments of ivory rods, um, some small fragments of rings made of um, same ivory and found with the rods, both rods and rings. You're, 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 it's either going to be 40 or 50. This is how accurate these excavations are. 
um, as well as the shells, were stained superficially with red and lay in the same red substance that enveloped the bones. Um, so here we go. Um, this 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 is um, this next bit is it tells us a lot about radiocarbon dating. Right, when the bones were originally identified eventually in 1912 to in fact be a bloke and from the Paleolithic period, we didn't actually actually have any real dates. It wasn't until the 1950s that radiocarbon dating was invented by a certain William Willard Libby um, in 1951. In the uh, 1960s, they decided to radiocarbon date the bones. And amazingly, the, the bones were radiocarbon dated to approximately 16,460 years uh, before present by a certain Kenneth Oakley, which truly is in the Paleolithic period. However, I'm wrong, aren't I? The bones do not date from 33,000 years ago. But then more dates were undertaken in 1989, 1995, which dated the bones to 26,000 years ago. I'm still wrong. Mm -hmm. um, however, in 2007, a new examination of the remains by, a, by Oxford University dated the bones to 29,000 years ago. I was only out by 4,000 years, wasn't I? Oh, forgot it. 2009, they redated the bones to be 33,000 years old. She's running over me. Well, you're not having a new pen. You only have one archaeology company pen a year. I tell Alan what to do when I get in. Yeah, I know. He don't have a clue what you're talking about. He phoned me yes, the other he week. Does, does he? Because you've got on quite well talking about everything. Oh, no, I know. Me and your husband, we've organised a, a meeting in the car park. I hope not, no. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle's coming as well. Oh, he said he'd come to these classes. I know, but he's too... What for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I don't know what that's saying. So um, the, the fascinating thing about this is that the radiocarbon dating um, uh, in archaeology, what we're seeing is is that as dating techniques improve, uh, the dates for things alter. They either get older and older, or newer, or newer. Um, and this has great implications for everything to do with archaeology. The new scientific techniques. We we've now we now we know more information that the individual. Uh, from the bone structure, 20% uh, of the diet was that of fish, semi-nomadic. Uh, we know from the other bones found in the burial that the individual uh, may have eaten mammoth, woolly, uh, rhinoceros, and re reindeer. Uh, to end today, I want to give you um, one little final interesting fact. Uh, and this, um, this is a very, very interesting fact indeed. And I'm going to... I'm going to throw it out to you. Um, we, we are coming up to look at um, caves in Wales, uh, Point Newith Cave in North Wales, but not this week because we're, we're just coming to the end. Um, interesting enough, uh, 12,000 years ago, as the ice is melting, waves of trees start to come over from the continent. So the waves of trees start to come over, the berry varieties first. Uh, for example, like the holly, uh, for example, maybe um, low-growing ewes, the common ewe. Uh, you've got the likes of hawthorn, um, service, um, uh, wild hawthorn. Their, the, their line of trees is actually moving further and further over to Britain, um, being deposited by birds because they, they, they've got um, fine berries. And then eventually in their wake, uh, you've got other trees uh, like hazel coming over. And as you know, um, those little beast of squirrels would bury the hazelnuts and then a tree would pop up and the line of hazel trees would be coming over to Britain. Um, and then eventually um, trees that would like water like the aspen um, and then other trees like the oak and elm would flow over to Britain. Um, and then eventually Ireland itself would be disconnected um, from uh, Britain say about 7,000 years ago. Britain would be disconnected from Europe about 8,000 years ago. Uh, but one very interesting fact here uh, is that according to modern research, 80% of the DNA of most white Britons, this isn't seen to be a racist statement, but I'm going to read it out, has been passed down from a few thousand individuals who hunted in this uh, region during the last ice age and just after about 12,000 years ago. Uh, this would indicate a significance uh, which dwarfs all subsequent migrations to Britain from Europe. 
So in other words, um, we've got 80% of our DNA um, goes back uh, approximately 12, 13, 14,000 years ago. And no matter how many people come over from Europe, the predominant, predominant DNA in Britain um, would overwhelm any groups of migrants coming over to this country. It's not meant to be a racist statement at all, but it goes to everything I've said before. When the Romans came over to Britain, there was literally, out of the British population, at the height of Roman Britain, about AD 300, there was probably 5, maybe 10% of all people living in Britain came from the continent. The 90% of them were actually native British. And then the Anglo-Saxon period, about 5% of the whole of Britain were Anglo-Saxon, except they called the, um, England Anglo-Saxon Britain, when in fact only 5% were actually Anglo-Saxon. The same with the Normans, even less Normans coming over here, and so on and so on. So this is really important. So what we're going to do next week, I've actually made a mistake with the title next week. We're actually going to be doing uh, the um, cave archaeology um, from North Wales, uh, looking at Pod New in a Cave, and Star Car the following week. Star Car the following week, yes. Star Car the following week. Pod New next week. And the interesting thing about Pod New is, is I've intimated the following that we've, we've got um, our human ancestors in this country. Um, we've got people in this country, living in this country, well before the end of the last ice age, 12,000 years ago. I've said Goff's Cave in Somerset, 15,000 years ago. At the height of the last ice age, 33,000 years ago, in a warmer period in the last glaciation, uh, you've got people living in Britain and in Wales. You've got evidence of our Neanderthal cousins living in Wales as well. And that's what we're looking at next week. Hopefully I've uh, managed to um, get you through this today. Have you all enjoyed this today? Thank you. Thank you very good, much. Good, good, good. 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 Um, and thank you very much. I'll see you all next week. Are you going to be here all next week? Not me. I'm going to look forward to this. All right, then. It's an interesting program on BBC4 on Monday. At night, I've got a good bell. Oh, lover, Gertrude Bell was the wonderful female archaeologist oh, yeah. who was responsible for creating the modern bound boundaries of Iraq, Syria, uh, and it was a female archaeologist yeah. who was solely responsible for all the problems and hardship that we're finding in the Middle East today. Well, yes, it was a woman who did it. That's right. That's right. That's oh. right. So in other words, it, yeah, the Gertrude Bell was a really talented archaeologist. She knew the landscape like the back of her hand and she was able to draw at the borders. But um, as you said, it was not done in the best way. It was done looking at politics rather than the landscape which Gertrude Bell so loved, but she had to go against the landscape. Associated with tea lovers as well. Oh yes, we've got tea. Exactly. Anyway, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. Wow. What did we do last Christmas? Uh, we, we, you got it in your book, haven't you? Pod New is the early, the early evidence of our ancestors in North Wales and West Wales. Pod New is P O M T N E D P O M T N E W Y D D. Pod New is D D. D D. Yes, that's right. YDD. I had I had BD once. You have people.